So chapter 15 is called Invertebrates, um, and we're starting a section that has to do with the animal kingdom. Zoology is what we call that, the study of the animal kingdom. Here are representatives of, of many of the, of the phyla that we find in the animal kingdom. Uh, you know, starfish, uh, we have sponges here, octopus, uh, like a jellyfish. Uh, obviously a tiger, you know, all kinds of different ones, and they all fit into different categories. When we did the, the lab with the biological key where you had to identify different pictures, you know, but kingdom, phylum, class is probably about the farthest we went on, uh, or the least we went through on some of them, some of them we knew farther than that, uh, by just looking at their characteristics. Uh, so. In the animal kingdom, studying that we call zoology. So we could call this, you know, this semester we could have called it zoology. And when we study plants, they call it botany. So what we want to talk about is on the bottom of your chart, you have these different names across the bottom. And uh, we want to make sure that you understand what it is that we're looking for. One of the things that I probably should point out that I uh, should have pointed out when we had the chart up on the screen, my, my example, is in each of these boxes, what are the representative uh, organisms that we're studying that would fit into here? Like when, when we're studying periphera, what, what animals fit into that one? That, and we'll just give you a couple of them. Um, to, that you can put in there as we go through those. Uh, you can find out which ones there are in the chapter. That's, that's the easy part, but that's what we, so when we say sponges, oh, that's, that's this phylum right here, it's peripheral. So for Tuesday, we're gonna grade the first two, or we're gonna just- Grade the first two, so you wanna have them filled out before class, yes. Very good question. So let's, do you see where movement is on your chart? It's way over on the right side, isn't it? Okay. So things that we need to be looking for if we're trying to fill in that part is do they have a way of moving around? Not everything moves around. Some of them are stuck in one place and we call them sessile. But how do they move? Uh, you know, obviously, like insects, they have legs or they can fly. Uh, if it happens to live in water, you know, they can, can it swim around or is it stuck in one place? We'll, uh, we'll study one thing, um, but, uh, it's called a, uh, and I just, the <laughs> name went out the window, uh, that is actually stuck in, in one place and so, and sometimes with the movement you might find out that well, it can move during this stage of its life, but then during this stage it doesn't move. Like maybe during their larval stage, they can move around, but then when they become an adult, they no longer can move around. Uh, you know, things like that. So that's what we mean by what you're looking for when you fill out that part about movement. Support is, you know, what gives their body shape. Um, if they're on land, they need a lot more support. If they're in water, the you know the buoyancy of the water keeps keeps their helps keep their shape, uh, but you bring that same thing up on land and it just kind of like just lays flat, you know, it has no support. Uh, so insects, for instance, they have an exoskeleton, you know, uh, their skeleton is on the outside, which is great, it protects them, but to be able to grow, they need to do what? You know what that word is? All insects have to do this to be able to grow. Is it molt? They have to molt, right? They have to molt their shell and kind of crawl out of it and get a new one. Uh, so that's, that's kind of like the downside. It also limits them as to how big they can get. Uh, I remember when I was uh, studying geology and looking and learning about fossils and things like that, and what's the biggest um, uh, you know, insect type fossil uh, that we can find. 
we've found some cockroaches that I think were, I remember reading they're like three foot cockroaches. They'd be big enough that I, I think if, you know, like a little baby could probably ride them, you know. Uh, so they were, they were big, you know. Uh, now we have an endoskeleton. So some of them are gonna have skeletons on the inside uh, for support. Um, but we read about the sponges, you know, that they have a different means of support. They have either some kind of fibers on the inside or actually spicules that are actually like made out of glass. Uh, do they have a protective body covering? You know, some do, some don't. Uh, some have fur on the outside to protect them. Quite often it's you know, serves, uh, you know, its main purpose is maybe either like for camouflage or for keeping them warm uh, in, uh, in winter. Uh, scales, that's what protects the outside, like fish, for instance. Uh, or we have skin, a lot of animals have skin and fur. We have a little bit of hair in humans. We don't have much hair. Uh, we just have, you know, hair in our head and the rest of our body is pretty, pretty sparse. Uh, uh, birds have feathers, you know, so that serves as protection, but for birds it's really important to be able to fly. You pluck a bird's all those feathers and they don't fly. Okay? Or some live in shells, you know, like clams and snails and things like that. Okay, then we have nutrition. Uh, that nutrition is kind of a, a bigger topic. So if you look in, at your chart, kind of there toward the middle, it talks about methods of obtaining food. Uh, that would be part of that. How do they, you know, they're almost all heterotrophic. They can't make their own food. So how do they obtain their food? Uh, some of them, uh, you know, will uh, like, uh, if you have jellyfish, they have stinging cells where they can sting their prey and paralyze them. Uh, you know, that's to help them be able to bring them, otherwise they'd fight too hard. You know, they'd paralyze them. Uh, you know, so how do they obtain their food? Um, digestion, how do they carry on digestion? Some of these have, you know, stomachs like we do, you know, where they can put the food inside the stomach and it digests it. Others, they can't, they don't have a stomach. To be able to digest it, they have to secrete digestive juices outside of their body and then absorb it. Yeah. So that's what we mean there by digestion. And then, uh, so there's ingestion, which means taking food in, taking food in, so when you eat, you are ingesting. We say, you know, we talk about somebody ingesting, what did they happen to ingest? Uh, maybe got something, we ate something we didn't know we were eating. Uh, digestion is how we break that, whatever we've eaten, down into a soluble form that our body can absorb. And then we have to assimilate it. How did we take that food and make it part of myself? grow or replace cells that have been damaged or, you know, whatever. So that's what we mean by in that section of nutrition. So there's a, several things there that you will find out. Um, respiration uh, is toward the right, uh, three-fourths of the way to the right is respiration. You know, how do they get oxygen into their body? Because every cell in the body needs to have oxygen. How do they do that? We get oxygen in our body because we have what? We have lungs, okay? And there's a lot of animals that have, have lungs. But unless you're a fish, you have, you have gills, okay? Or if you're an insect, you have little tubules that carry air through little holes in your body to other parts of it. Now, our oxygen get, we take it, our lungs do the, uh, taking the oxygen out of the air, but then it's the bloodstream, the circulation that carries the oxygen to all the cells of the body that need it. 
Whereas in, like in insects, well, let's not do that part. Let's just take air right to the cells or directly where they need it. So they have little tubes that carry air. You know, God it was very creative with all the different living things that he's made. So many different um, ways of doing the same things. But what we're trying to learn is how do they do it? You know, they ha all have to do these things. How do they do it? Now, there's some things that they don't need to do, if we found out. And you'll, and you'll have some boxes in your chart that you're just going to leave blank because they don't need to do that. Okay, circulation. Uh, there's actually two kinds of circulation systems. There's a closed circulation system. That's ours. Our blood always has to flow in vessels, either through the heart, through arteries, through capillaries, through veins, back to the heart again. But it never leaves the heart. If it does, there's problems going on. And we can injure ourselves in ways to get, to cause some of the blood to get outside of these vessels, and that shows up as these purple bruises, purple and red bruises that we have, and as the uh, red blood cells or the start breaking down, then we start getting these other colors, these yellows and greens colors that you have, you know, if you've ever sprained an ankle or something like that. Now, an open circulatory system is one, they still have something that circulates. In other words, they have to have something that's functioning like a heart, but it pumps blood out, and then it just got to seep its way back to the heart. And it has uh, some vessels on the other side of the heart that collect all of it and then pump it out again. But it, it doesn't always flow in vessels. That would be like a clam that uh, does that. Then excretion is to get rid of liquid waste. Okay? Um, the soluble waste that are uh, in your body, ours, liquid waste, is in the form of urine, right? Birds, do birds urinate? You don't see them, you know, doing number one. It just looks like always number two, but the number two is always pretty runny, isn't it? Because it actually mixes the two. The solid part of their waste and the liquid part of their waste is put together and that's what they get rid of. They get rid of them, both of them at the same time. They don't, and you notice that if you've ever watched birds uh, for a while, they have certain times they like to get rid of that extra waste. One of the things they often do is just before taking off, they dump, it, it decreases their mass, right? That will decrease their mass means they're lighter, right? It just makes total sense the way, you know, what we learned last year in physical science. You know, you have less mass, it's going to be easier to accelerate. Uh, and they sometimes often are doing it, you know, just before they land. Well, that means they're lighter, they have less momentum, it's easier to stop something that has less mass. I mean, it's... It, what they do is just, I mean, is just from a physics point of view, is just total, makes total sense why they do things the way they do, but they just do it instinctively. It's, somebody didn't have to tell them, you gotta learn, you gotta learn your physics first before you can fly. No, they just do it. Uh, uh, response, uh, we call it irritability. So down on your uh, chart, you have a nervous system. And I think, um, I don't think we have anything else that we, that goes in that section. I think it just has nervous system. Uh, so how do they respond to changes in their environment? Uh, so, you know, like for us, we have a brain that, where we can make decisions about things. Then we have kind of what would be it doesn't function like a brain, but it, it, it's sort of a, a, a simple con control center called ganglion where maybe a stimulus goes to a certain spot and it sends a signal right back to, to respond. There's no thought went into it. 
There's no brain involved. That would be like this. Then you have some of them that have a nerve net. They just have a bunch of nerves that are interconnected with each other. And uh, so they can control movement and stuff like that, but never, you know, no thought goes into it, no uh, intelligence goes in, it's just, just the way they've been programmed. Kind of, kind of like robots, you know, they remember uh, last year when our robots, they had like the whiskers, you ran into something, the whisker touched it, it read, the res uh, read that it, the whisker had been touched, and then we had programmed in this automatic response. Back up, turn left, and go forward. Went right into something, back up, turn left. Or if it was the left whisker, hit it, back up, turn right. That's all it knew how to do. And what happened when it got to a corner? It just gets stuck, it just goes left corner, right corner, left corner, right corner left corner, right corner. And there's a lot of these animals just don't know what to do in situations like that. Just keep doing the same thing over and over again, hoping for different results. But <laughs> that's just the way it is, you know? But for the most part, it works. Uh, so they can't get trapped, in other words. Okay, reproduction. Uh, they, that is the third from the right is where re it talks about reproduction. Uh, you know, how do they make more of themselves? There's, there are going to be some of them that uh, can, like the hydra, which I was trying to think of before, uh, will actually grow a bump on the side of it, and it will actually grow into another hydra right off the side. Then after it's reached a certain size and maturity, it'll just fall off and get stuck to the ground, and we have another hydra. So that would be asexual reproduction. Most animals can't do that, but there's some that do. Um, so, and then we also, that would be classified as budding, is what we do. Like, it's like a little bud at first, and it grows into a whole nother uh, individual. Now, some can regenerate parts that are missing. Like, if you grab a hold of a lizard's tail, what does it often do? just disconnects and uh, runs off. You know, you can have the tail, I don't need it. Because it can grow its tail back again. So it can regenerate lost parts. Uh, or like a starfish, you know, uh, if you were trying to get rid of starfish and chop it up into a lot, a lot of little pieces, you aren't getting rid of the starfish because as long as it has certain pieces of the original starfish, as long as those pieces are present, it will grow all the missing parts. Now, it'd be nice if we could regenerate missing parts, too. You can up to a point. What I've been told, I learned this a long time ago, that on, uh, on newborns, if, let's say, their finger got pinched in a door and it chopped the end of it off, if they don't uh, stitch the tissue back around it but just leave it open like that and protect it, you know, to keep it from getting infected, it'll actually grow to the tip of their finger back. But when they close it up and, you know, and suture it shut, then it won't. But most people don't want their little baby, <laughs> they'd rather have it stitched shut. I, I remember talking to my brother-in-law who's a doctor and he says, yeah, that would be the best way, but most parents aren't really ready to try that, you know, to let it grow back. Now, that doesn't mean you're gonna, if you knocked it off here, it'd grow the whole finger back, but the tip of your finger, he says, and I, the way I understand it, even, even the nail, it'll grow the nail back. So, I mean, you have to grow the nail bed, which is up in here. But, you know, so some, th some animals can do this, and we would like to learn, is there a way that, you know, what chemicals can stimulate or turn on genes again to make certain things grow? Because wouldn't that be nice if we could figure out how we could, if somebody becomes paralyzed, how we could maybe do something to cause those nerves to regrow again and they have complete control of their body again. That'd be nice. I mean, I know they, there's people that are working on that uh, and we're make, making some progress with some animals. I don't know 
we haven't been successful yet with humans, but uh, you know, what can we do to encourage that? I think one of those hyperbaric chambers is where, uh, you, where you put them in a high, higher pressure and oxygen, and they can heal some things like that a little bit better, but we've never been able to just like regenerate yet uh, well at all. Okay, uh, and then all of these animals that we're talking about have a way of reproducing sexually. So um, under reproduction, you'll always have to say something about how do they reproduce sexually. Uh, embryonic stages, you know, when we, the egg is fertilized and it grows at first, we talk about it being an embryo. Uh, and then it'll become a fetus, you know, after all the features are there and it's mature to a certain point, we call it a fetus. Uh, some of them, some of these animals actually have a larval stage where they look quite, quite different than they do as an adult, but it's just part of their life cycle. Uh, you know, for instance, like a caterpillar looks quite different than it does as a butterfly. It has one phase that looks different, but it's all part of the completed life cycle. So that's what you'll want to put in that part there about reproduction. Now, you'll notice in the first column it talked about symmetry, and we wrote down, or we saw that what it said about the sponges is they either had asymmetry symmetry or radial symmetry. Okay? So, uh, if you were to divide this organism in some direction, and you get, you, know, you need to try all the different directions, uh, is there a balance? You know, is there one side like the other? If it doesn't matter which way I would cut it, for instance, and I always get two balanced sides, then it's going to be radial symmetry. But we can only be cut one way and have, at least superficially, two sides that look the same. I can only be cut this way, right? And have a left and a right side. So we would have what's called bilateral symmetry. Bilateral symmetry. Um, so there's, there's some things that are just asymmetrical. There's no way I can cut it and get two separate halves. Uh, and we have at least bilateral symmetry. Um, so spherical would be, you know, if you have some of these animals that we're going to talk about, they're actually, they're round like a ball. So I, it doesn't matter which way I chop it, this way, this way, this way, it's always the same. So we call that spherical symmetry. Uh, radio is one that I can only cut it in one direction, but I can cut it many different ways in that one direction and still get to equal halves. So that's going to be called radial symmetry. This uh, would, would be one of those uh, that would be like that. Bilateral, we said we were like frogs. Most animals that you and I think of are going to have bilateral symmetry. Okay, there's some other names that we want to get familiar with. Lateral means to the side. Okay. And the way, I don't know, did we talk about lateral in here? Not quite yet. Uh, that in football, when you are running down the field, and let's say you're about to tackle, you can pass the ball to somebody to the side of you, right? And then they can keep running. And that pass is called a lateral. So it means to the side. Uh, so, you know, when you can cut it this way and have bilateral symmetry, that means you have two sides. The middle is called you the medial. So when they use the word medial, it means middle. Kind of like me. Uh, no, we'll just leave it at that. Okay. Uh, the front end of something is called the anterior, and then the back end is called the posterior. Everybody knows that one, but you probably didn't know what the What's the word for the opposite of posterior? It's anterior, the front of the animal. Uh, if, it's, if the animal actually has a head end, then we talk about cephalic. So if you notice that on your chart, you have uh, 
cephalization, in other words, does it have something that corresponds to a head that kind of controls things? That would be cephalization uh, there. Uh, so this is the medial line or midline. If I were to cut an animal across this way, that's called transverse, when you're going from side to side across something. If I was cut through this way, then you and you looked at the, <laughs> that you would look at a transverse section as opposed to a uh, a medial section where you could see all the all the way from my head down. 